Welcome to worship. We have some upcoming events we want to make sure that you think about and sign up for. One is our virtual gingerbread house project this year. Uh, we want to invite all of you to participate. Sign up and we can get materials to you, but sign up today. Hello, Leewood United Methodist Church. We need your help with a candlelight challenge. To help us prepare for Christmas Eve, what you need is a candle, a match, a dark room, and your camera. We, our goal is to have a virtual lighting of the Christmas Eve candles, just like someone sitting in the pew next to you, even though we'll be virtual this year. So what you'll do is you'll turn your camera sideways, and this makes your camera actually go over here now, so you might be aware of that. And you want to be about this far away from it, and um, imagine that it's divided into nine squares. So your head is kind of um, in the top, the top line and the middle square, if that makes sense. <laughs> and what you'll do is you'll take your candle, and you'll pass it from the right, back to the left, and then back to center. I'm gonna get some help from some other people in my house to see how it works. Okay, we turned off the camera flash, so that helps. All right, now to the right, and back to the center, and to the left. And smile. We would love to have everyone participate in our virtual Christmas Eve candle lighting. So invite your friends and neighbors, ask them to, to participate and we'll pass the light of Christ to one another in this wonderful way. The, what we'd like for you to do is email the files to the email listed here below. And we'd like to have them by December 6th. I hope that you can join us. Thanks so much. Check your email announcements for more ways to connect with our church family. There's a bunch of things coming up for Advent. I want you to be aware of.
been focused for a few short weeks on the challenge of living in what we call scarcity, a place focused on fear, doubt, and uncertainty, and not upon God's abundance and love. This is the beginning of a time of thanksgiving this week, a time to consider all for which we give thanks, including the church. Part of our thankfulness is reflected in our financial giving. Most of you have received a letter with an estimate of giving card. We hope you've prayerfully set aside some time to consider how and why you give. If you have filled out your estimate of giving card, we invite you to drive by the church today between 1 and 1.30 to personally drop off your cards. We're going to have a celebration of giving. You'll see balloons, and we may even have something special for you, too. Of course, you can simply mail them or uh, scan them and email them, too. And I want to thank you in advance for your generosity during these scary times. I've completed mine, as you can see. Done all my work. A note which you may have not had time to notice as I hand it up to you is that uh, I've decided to increase our giving this year by about $1,000. So I think it's important for us to share the message of, uh, of hope. And I don't offer that to you to brag but or to claim some kind of specialness about this, but I think we're at a time where generosity will will define who we are. And so I just encourage you to prayerfully consider what you're going to offer this year. Let us pray together. Loving God, we come to you full of anxiety about what might happen in the coming days and weeks. Shower us with the peace Jesus promised to his disciples. Make us into steady pillars for those around us. In this time of uncertainty and epidemic, wake us up to the reminder that we are not alone. Even as we are asked to keep our distance from others and still help us to find ways to reach out to those who need our support. Remind us each time we wash our hands that in our baptism, you call us to let go of our fears and live in joy, peace, and hope. Amen. God stretches out in the heavens and shapes the earth. Come and give thanks. God raises up the mountains and pours water into the seas. Come and give thanks. God calls forth plants from the soil and forms animals in infinite variety. Come and give thanks. God breathes upon us and fills us with life. Come, lift your voices in praise. God gives our lives meaning through laughter and tears. Come, lift your voices in praise. God touches our hearts through family and friends. Come, lift your voices in praise. 
God loves us and blesses us with everything good. Come and worship. God loves us and overwhelms us with never-ending generosity. Come and worship. God loves us and surrounds us with love and abundance. Come and worship. Enjoy this story of generosity from Katherine Hepburn. Once, when I was a teenager, my father and I were standing in line to buy tickets for the circus. Finally, there was only one other family between us and the ticket counter. This family made a huge impression on me. They had eight children, all probably under the age of 12. The way they were dressed, you could tell they didn't have a lot of money, but their clothes were neat and clean. The children, they were all well behaved. All of them stood in line, two by two, behind their parents, holding hands. They were excitedly jabbering about the clowns, the animals, and all the acts they would be seeing that night. By their excitement, you could sense that they had never been to the circus before. It would be a highlight of their lives. The father and mother were at the head of the pack, standing as proud as they could be. The mother was holding her husband's hand, looking up at him as if to say, you are my knight in shining armor. He was smiling, enjoying, seeing his family happy. The ticket lady asked the man, how many tickets did he want? He proudly responded, I'd like to buy eight children's tickets and two adult tickets so I can take my family to the circus. The ticket lady stated the price. The man's wife let go of his hand her head dropped. The man's lip began to quiver. Then he leaned a little closer and asked, How much did you say? The ticket lady again stated the price. The man didn't have enough money. How was he supposed to turn and tell his eight kids he didn't have enough money to take them to the circus? Seeing what was going on, my dad reached into his pocket and pulled out a $20 bill. He dropped it on the ground. We were not wealthy in any sense of the word. My father bent down, picked up the $20 bill, tapped the man on the shoulder and said, Excuse me, sir, I believe this fell out of your pocket. The man understood what was going on. He was not begging for a handout, but certainly appreciated the help in a desperate, heartbreaking, and embarrassing situation. He looked straight into my dad's eyes took my dad's hands in both of his, squeezed tightly onto the $20 bill and with his lip quivering and a tear streaming down his cheek, he replied, thank you, thank you, sir. This really means a lot to me and my family. My father and I went back to our car and we drove home. The $20 that my dad gave away is what we were going to buy our own tickets with. Although we didn't get to see the circus that night, we both felt a joy, a joy inside us that was far greater than seeing whatever the circus could have provided. That day I learned the value to give. The giver is bigger than the receiver. If you want to be large, larger than life, learn to give. 
Love has nothing to do with what you are expecting to get, only with what you are expecting to give, which is everything. The importance of giving, blessing others, can never be overemphasized because there is always joy in giving. Learn to make someone happy by acts of giving. looking for somebody to play Monopoly with me. Is that a game you've ever played before? It's a really old game. It's actually more than 80 years old and it's played all over the world in more than 100 different countries and you can actually buy this game in more than 40 different languages. And even today they have worldwide tournaments of Monopoly players. Monopoly is a little bit like our lives in some ways. There are players. Each player gets to choose one of these little tokens. I always like this little dog. I always hoped I got to be the dog when we played. The players can buy property all around the board and they can do things with the properties. They can take little houses, buy them and put them on the property or even hotels if they have lots of money. Some of the neighborhoods are uh, more expensive than others. If you buy the neighborhood way over here, Baltic Avenue and Mediterranean, they're fairly inexpensive. But when you get all the way around the board to Boardwalk and Park Place, that's expensive property. You can have businesses like you could buy the electric company or you could even buy railroads. You have to pay taxes sometimes if you land on the luxury tax or the income tax. And some players even end up having to go to jail. Well, everyone starts out the game with the same amount of money. We have a bank over here for that. As you roll the dice, you move around the board and you make choices about how you want to spend your money. The goal is to have the most money while all the other players lose theirs. The person that wins the game is the person that has lots of money when nobody else has any left. So, as you go around the board, you decide if you want to buy property or businesses. And then you decide if you want to build houses or hotels on your property. When other people land on your property, they have to pay you rent so you can collect money from them. Or, if you land on their property, you have to pay them. Well, we played this game a lot when I was really young. Sometimes people wanted to win so badly that they played unfairly. I think we call that cheating. They might take money from the bank when nobody was looking, or they might maybe count wrong when they're moving around the board because they want to land in a certain place. Hmm. Or they might pick up either a chance card or a community chess card and they might read it differently than what it really says on it so that they can get an advantage out of it. They wanted to win and make the most money so badly that they put winning the game before being fair or being nice to other players. Well, what do you think God would think those, about those players who wanted the most money and would break his rules to get it. It probably would make God frown, wouldn't it? Well, in our real life, sometimes people can want money so badly, they forget about God's rules and how God wants them to behave. They start to sort of worship the money and the things that money can buy, and they do that more than they worship God. The Bible tells us that money's not evil, but the love of money can cause people to do evil things. 
The Bible says that it's okay to be rich if we keep our eyes on God and do good things with our money. The Bible wants us to be generous and share with others. Can you think of some good things we can do with our money? Later on today, see how long of a list you and your family can make about good, generous things to do with your money. Well, when the Monopoly game is over, all the pieces go back in the box. And everybody, everybody who was playing the game has everything that they had at the beginning of the game. And that's kind of like life too, isn't it? When we finish our life, which is hopefully a really long time from now, all of our money and all of our things stay here without us. But we keep our life with God. God, His Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are always our best treasures, and they're always with us. Hmm. Let's pray together. Dear God, we are so grateful for all of the gifts that you give us. When we begin to want things, more things, please remind us to remember all that we have and to be happy with that. You bless us so richly. Remind us to be generous people who share our gifts with others. And God, thank you most of all for our most important gift, your Son, Jesus Christ. And all the people said, Amen. All right, this one's for Ian. We're going to count it off. One, one two, a one, one, two, three. <laughs> Will you join me in this time of prayer? God of grace, you have gifted us with a world of abundance, a land of plenty, a country where we have all we need. We come before you this day to thank you for this prosperity and to repent from our apparent inability to share this wealth. God, we declare our own complicity in systems that sustain some of us. 
while forsaking many others. And we come before you to seek your forgiveness even as we pray for your justice. Righteous God, you hear the cry of the poor. You listen to those who do without while so many spend recklessly. And our leaders invest the wealth of the nation in instruments of destruction. Be with us this day, Lord. Hear our prayers. Touch our hearts that we may be faithful witnesses and effective voices for justice. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Friends, hear these words from 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 to 19. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But we have food and clothing. We will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from their faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. 
Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you have made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Moving out of scarcity. Paul wrote to Timothy. He didn't want him to get comfortable or complacent. Now, I understand how that can happen. It can happen in anyone's life. I've been a pastor here for seven and a half years. I can now say that I know where the mission closet is. It took me about four and a half years to figure that out, but now I know. I, I also know how to reboot the elevator. Some of you probably don't even know that. I know how to restart the network for the computers. I know a lot of stuff, and I've gotten into a lot of habits of ministry, assumed a lot of things, which are not all bad, of course, but suddenly a pandemic strikes, and I'm not in cruise control anymore. All of our normal patterns are gone replaced by stuff we never thought we would do. So I get it that most of us probably long for some comfort and complacency right now. The very thing that Paul is warning Timothy about. But change can open our eyes to new ways of thinking. Paul reminds Timothy and reminds us that the key to life is contentment with godliness. Don't get tra trapped by harmful and senseless desires like the love of money. You can you know, back up to Anne's conversation in the children's moment today. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Life is not about earning a trip to heaven. It's not works righteousness because the ticket's already free. Rather, it's the only sensible response to God's grace. What Jesus, Paul, and others point us all towards is a different way of living, another way to consider how we live and how we do things, including how we view money and giving. This new way, this new life, as the bishop reminded us at our Kansas City District Conference this week, isn't clear yet. The new normal, if you will, hasn't emerged from this time of challenge. What will be true, however, is that the new way remembers that the real treasure isn't about acquisition or amassing wealth, but models a life built on generosity, on sharing as a people of God. Marsha's Children's Moment a couple weeks ago reminded us that giving can be joyful. And each of us must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Our generosity flows from God's abundance and grace already given to us. As Paul said, God is able to provide you with every blessing and abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Every good work. Not just your good works. 
every good work. The ultimate gift given to us is the love of God, which cannot be earned. No money can buy the providence of God. And and Jesus has already given us extravagant love and an invitation to be the people of God. The irony in moving out of scarcity, scarcity is that we don't have to pick up and go anywhere. Rather, we're called to transform the places within and around us with the evidence of God's love and grace alive in us. We're called to share gifts of abundance to a hungry world. How can we offer radical generosity to transform the places where we are? That is our challenge. As a church and as individual members in it, when we confess our sins, we seek a right relationship with God. We get in right relationship with our neighbors, with the world, and with ourselves. God seeks to set our lives in order, restoring balance and order. So how we interact, how we talk, and love reflects God's grace. How we spend our money reflects that right relationship as well. Since Paul's time, God has worked mightily through the church, and we are a part of that amazing body. We are a part of every good work done then, now, and in the future. Every good work. Our participation reflects our priorities and ultimately our relationship to God. We can be a church filled with hope and action. A church that worships enthusiastically, hears the word preached, studies the word accountably to each other and to our faith. A church that serves the world as those for whom Christ has died. Our prayer lives, our prayers are at the heart of our generosity. When we give our time, our money, we share our possessions, it is because of God's grace and generosity of love that moves us. Here in this season of Thanksgiving, we prayerfully celebrate grace and generosity. And we've learned the truth about what matters. Paul told Timothy not to be drawn into the world's view, but instead pursue righteousness, holy living, faithfulness, love, endurance, and gentleness. Sometimes when we hear those words, we forget that we don't do that from a place of being better than anyone else. That's why Paul goes on to say, let us not be haughty or set our hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God. Let us do good, be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, storing up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. So truly, we may take hold of the life that really is life and life abundant. Amen. Calls humanity to win.
Friends, as we go forth from this place. Even in these crazy times. Even when so much seems to hang on. This pandemic that is overwhelming our, our world right now, honestly. Keep your eyes fixed on God. Remember the grace and abundance that God has put into your life, no matter what the circumstance. And live your life with a joy that runs deep in that grace. And go in peace. Amen. <laughs>